Welcome students to my session on community mobilization and the tasks involved in community mobilization. My name is Russell D'Souza and uh, I work as assistant professor at uh, Nirmala Institute of Education, which is a college of teacher education in the state of Goa. Uh, to begin with, let us look at the outline. So the very first thing that we will look at is uh, what is the basis for a community mobilization initiative. The second aspect is the steps involved in community mobilization. And the third one is an illustration. So to begin with, when we look at planning and implementation of a community mobilization initiative, there are certain questions that we need to answer. And these questions are very pertinent for us. For instance, where is the community? Now for a teacher, that is you or me, the community is the place where the school is located. Now, the next question before us is, what are the pressing issues of this community? We need to understand that every single community has issues at hand. Some issues which are very important to be tackled immediately and some issues probably which have less importance. So what are those issues? For example, are we looking at health and hygiene? Are we looking at capacity building of our school going children? Are we looking at cleanliness around? Are we looking at garbage? Are we looking at sensitizing the adult population? So these are different issues that a community is faced with. Remember that different communities have different issues. They do not remain the same. Yes, to some extent there would be some commonality, but largely they would be different. So, what needs and opportunities does the community most want to pursue first or urgently? So, from these issues that I mentioned, which is that issue or issues that the community wants to look at immediately? That's the urgent issue. What resources does the community have at hand? That's another very important question that we as community mobilizing agents need to know. What strategies and activities will move the community from where it is to where it wants to be? So what are those strategies and activities? Again, I want to come in and say that the strategy that you use for mobilization in a particular community may not work in another community because communities are different. They have their own peculiar identity. And so, strategies that are used in one place may not work. And what resources can be mobilized to address these priorities? So, we need to be very careful about all these questions. So, the moment we start answering these questions, it gives us some sort of a direction as to what can we can do as community mobilizers. Now, there are certain steps or tasks that are involved in a community mobilization initiative. So the very first one is identifying the community. Now, for us teachers, the immediate community, as I said a while ago, is the community around the school. So that's our community. And we can identify the community very easily. The second aspect is defining the problem or the difficulty. So what is that immediate problem or difficulty that the community wants to address? That is the second step. So that's what is called defining the problem or difficulty. The third aspect concerns identifying resources that are available in the community. So, you identify, you define the problem or the difficulty and now we go into a very, very crucial area and that is identifying what are the resources that are available in the community 
that will help us in this initiative. The fourth aspect is establishing a community mobilization group. So you have identified all the resources or most of the resources that are required for this particular campaign or this particular initiative. But we need to go a step further and establish or create a community mobilization group. So this community mobilization group is a group that will help in the community mobilization initiative. The fifth aspect, a component or step is formulating goals designing strategies and drawing assessment indicators. Now, formulating goals is very important because without goals, we do not know how to go about with the, with the initiative or the intervention or the program. We need to have a clear-cut idea that's going to give us direction. And so goals give us direction. And that's the reason why we begin with formulation of our goals. Now, goals will help us to design strategies. So, the nature of the goal determines the nature of the strategy or strategies that will be used in the achievement of the goal. And another very important aspect there is we need to, we need to construct or formulate or draw our assessment indicators. So, our assessment indicators will tell us how to go about measuring the performance or the success of this particular initiative or intervention. The next step or stage is developing an action plan with a time frame. Look at this very carefully. We have to develop an action plan along with a time frame. So the action plan is concerned with how am I going to go ahead with this particular campaign? Who will be doing what? How will it be done? When will it be done? Who is going to be responsible for, for monitoring, guiding, supporting? Now, you as a teacher, you have a very large role to play here because you would actually spearhead, you would actually help in the monitoring, you would help in guiding. So, you are some sort of a pivot in this particular initiative. And it happens within a time frame. So you do not get extended time. We have to work within a limit. So we define a limit. The seventh step is talking about implementing the plan and activities. So implementing of the plan of activities is a very important step here. Because we actually, we actually roll out the whole plan in the community. We actually begin our real work with the community. And the last step is concerned with monitoring and evaluation of the whole initiative. So, to sum it up, there are eight steps or stages which are very important. Every step helps us to lead to the subsequent step. We cannot be missing a single step in here. Please note that, dear teachers. We cannot be missing a single step. Rather, we follow a sequence of steps from start to the end and remember that you have a very very important role to play in here as the community mobilizing agent. We will try to understand or rather apply all these steps in an illustration. So what I have for you here is an example of a community mobilization initiative. You will see three columns here. The first column uh, which has a number that indicates the steps. The second one will list out the steps and the third one is concerned with the activity or the, or the specific task that is happening at every single stage. So let's go to the first stage that is identifying the community. So in my illustration, the community that I am looking at is the fishing community. Step number two is concerned with defining the problem or the difficulty. Now, this problem or difficulty is an observation by a teacher at school. And so, the observations of the teacher are as follows. The very first observation is, there is a lack of motivation to study. Number two, 
These children find it difficult to adjust to class and out of class learning as most are first generation learners. So there are two difficulties or two issues that we have already looked at. Let's go further. They are seen to possess poor self-confidence. The level of aspiration is not high, it's low. They give up very easily on any task that they encounter. That means they must be having probably a poor self-image or maybe a poor self-esteem. They have a difficulty adjusting with peers and other students. When I say peers, it means their own classmates. So they have a difficulty in adjusting with their peers and other students from the school. They have a poor language ability. Naturally, since they are first generation learners, it is but expected that they would have language uh, difficulty. And the last one is they have unsatisfactory grades. So that means there are so many problems that are observed by this particular teacher who is the class one teacher who has been teaching them and who has been observing them over a period of three months. Let's proceed. The third aspect is, or the third step is, identifying the different resources that are available in the community. Now we want to find a way to tackle these particular difficulties or these particular problems or issues. And so we need to now identify the resources that are available in the community which we can make use of for the betterment of these students. So let's have a look at this. So we look at teachers, teachers from the same school. And we can also make use of teachers from the neighboring school or the neighborhood. Now, when I say teachers from the neighborhood, I just don't pick any teacher and bring them to my school or maybe make them a part of this initiative. I would look at a quality teacher who has competence in helping such type of children and teachers from the same school because the child has a rapport with the teacher or teachers in the school. The second one is parents. Not any parents but parents who are receptive parents and who belong to the same community. Now why? Because these parents would actually work with the actual parents of the children who are found to have this difficulty. The third one is learning facilitators from the same community who are pursuing higher education or are employed. So when I look at learning facilitators, these are people from that same community, the fishing community, who have probably excelled or who are doing well or who may have gone into technical education and got a degree probably or maybe who are employed some way or maybe self-employed but definitely people who have gone beyond their difficulties and achieved some amount of success. Why? Because these people can be used as role models for these children who have a difficulty. The next one is the material support definitely we require a lot of material support and this support would be by way of audio video materials, films and so we need to look at the community and see if at all something is there. If not, we would need to source it from another community. The next aspect is the area around the school campus may be required for recreation and team building games and other activities. So if at all the school does not have a big campus or it does not have a playground around it, we can look at vacant land in the community that can be made use of for these initiatives. You may need to get permission, definitely, but for the good of the children, definitely anybody in the community would be willing to offer support. The next one is support from a DLED, from a DLED faculty member who lives in the vicinity of the school. So there is a DLED faculty member who lives in and around the school. So we can make use of this faculty member as well. And then we also have the village education committee members who can also be roped in to support this initiative. So 
learners, if you have been very careful, we have looked at a number of resources from the community that can actually be pulled. Now, the question before us is, do we make use of all the resources or most of the resources? Well, it depends. It depends on what are our goals that we want to achieve. So, the next very important thing is establishing a community mobilization group. So, based on the identified resources that we have seen in the previous step, that's step number three, a community mobilization group is created by the same teacher who has observed that the children have a difficulty. Now, this group will comprise the identified resources and the teacher who has actually created this mobilization group has to maintain a constant dialogue with the different resources from the community, particularly the human resource, and also to get the, uh, to get the material resource together. So, if you look very carefully, the role of the teacher is just not to create a mobilization group, but the teacher has to drive it. The teacher has to synchronize it. So, if the teacher is not active, then we very well know what will happen to the mobilization group. The next step is formulating goals, designing strategies and drawing assessment indicators. Now, the mobilized group has to write SMART goals. I repeat, SMART goals for each area where improvement is needed. For example, we know that improvement is needed in so many areas because the teacher has identified a couple of areas where students face difficulties. So, which are the areas where they need improvement? So, the areas are these. Increase learner motivation. Second one is developing the learner and ability to engage actively in learning. The third one is develop an ability to work with peers and other learners. The fourth one, develop proficiency in language for effective communication. So, develop proficiency in language for effective communication. The next one is improve their achievement in the different school subjects. And the last one is facilitate development of language for knowledge acquisition. So, a question before us is, what do we mean by SMART goals? So, SMART goals are defined as goals with specific criteria, very, very specific, which are remembered easily by using the acronym S-M-A-R-T, SMART. So, S refers to specific. Specific means the goals are very clear and extremely concise. M stands for measurable. That is the ability to track the progress of the learners as they become a part of the intervention program. A stands for achievable. That is goals that can be achieved. R stands for relevant. Relevant relevant to what you want to be achieved. And T stands for timely. That is a time frame that is attached to the goal for its completion. So, if we are going to write our goals, then our goals need to be smart. So, it's only when our goals are smart, they give us direction. So, if our goals are not smart, they will not give us direction. So, as teachers, how do we go about writing our goals is a very important question before us. Let us consider an illustration. Um, let us look at this particular goal. That is to develop proficiency in language for effective communication. And this is one of the issues which the teacher has observed because the children do not have proficiency. And so, the goal is to develop proficiency in language for effective communication. Now, if you look very carefully at that graphic before you, you will find skills which subdivide into receptive and productive, 
And under receptive, you have listening and reading. And under productive, you have speaking and writing. This means that we need to expose our learners to these four basic language skills. That is listening, reading, speaking and writing. So based on this goal that we have before us, the teacher can devise engaging strategies that will be employed in the intervention program that will be formulated. So, what strategies could be planned to develop language proficiency in the learners? So, the very first strategy is expose the learner to listening. You want to develop the listening ability? Then, use the strategy of multimedia, make use of movies, get them to listen to news, get them to listen to conversations, maybe recorded conversations or maybe your conversation with another person, let them listen. Talks, maybe by teachers from the same school, maybe by teachers from the community or maybe you invite somebody from the community because if you want them to develop the skill of listening, then they have to listen. The second one is you want to develop the competency that is a speaking competency that expose them to speaking. Make use of vocabulary. Engage them in conversation. Let them converse with you. Let them converse with their peers. Engage in language games. Role plays. Plays. So in other words, we will make use of the strategy that is known as the LSRW strategy. That is listening, speaking, write, uh, reading and writing. So LSRW strategy. How will the achievement of the learners be determined? So what are the indicators against which performance mapping will be done? So if I'm looking at listening, then my indicators would be as follows. Listens to English words and sentences used in class and responds in home language or English. For example, words like self, family, friends, brother, vegetables, names of animals, the second one is follows a story and is able to respond to simple questions that are based on the story. So the child listens and the child is able to tell you what he has listened. Follow simple greetings and polite forms of expression in English. For example, how are you? What is your name? Where do you live? Associates objects or persons to words that he hears. And the last one is enjoys rhyme and rhythm of poems and participates joyfully by singing aloud. So the child listens to rhyme and rhythm and he participates joyfully. And when we look at speaking, the indicators would be as follows. He is able to tell about himself through simple sentences, narrates experiences that he has experienced that those are called self-experiences or incidents or stories. Transcodes information from visual to the verbal form and from verbal to the visual form. The sixth step that is concerned with developing an action plan with a time frame. So every activity that is planned must have a time frame to be implemented and evaluated. So a time frame to execute the plan of activities must be meticulously designed. So you require a time frame, a timetable. Without a timetable, it is very, very difficult to execute because you never know how much time you require for what. The seventh step is concerned with implementing the plan of activities, that is capacity building. So capacity building must develop and strengthen the capacities of the learner and at this point of time, the action plan is put into practice. So whatever is your action plan, that is put into practice and now the intervention program starts. So as a teacher who is a part of this intervention program, you have to lie with every single resource you have to connect with every single resource and person so that you are on schedule. The eighth step 
is concerned with monitoring and evaluation. So this is a process that closely looks into what is done, who has done, how was it done, how else could it be done. So every aspect of the intervention program is followed very, very closely. Thank you.